Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kara Romano, and I'm the Executive Editor of Consumer Goods Technology. I would like to welcome you all to today's web seminar, a continuing part of the Consumer Goods Web Connection Series. We appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to join us today, and we especially would like to thank One Network Enterprises for their support in sponsoring this event. Today we'll be, we will be talking about select. Today we'll be talking about supplier collaboration within demand-driven supply chains and how one leading company, Del Monte Foods, has extended its demand-driven principles to its supply network of co-manufacturers, co-packers, raw material suppliers, and 3PL providers to reduce overall inventory costs and improve operational efficiency. For our discussion today, we will be joined by two industry leaders who will share their insights and then we'll have an interactive Q&A session. Our first speaker today will be David McLean, who is the Chief Procurement Officer at Del Monte Foods, where he leads the company's global purchasing and commodity hedging processes. Since joining in 2007, he has focused on commodity cost variance at risk supplier risk management and boundary punishment optimization and has deployed a company-wide secure-to-pay solution. Prior to Del Monte, David served in various operational and consulting roles such as President of Lighting Trade Group and Practice Leader and Partner at Tatum LLC. Our second speaker today will be Todd Walker, the Product Marketing Director at One Network Enterprises, where he is responsible for product direction and customer satisfaction of One Network's intelligent supply solution. Todd brings 15 years of experience delivering sourcing, procurement, supply chain collaboration, and B2B integration solutions for a variety of industry segments. Prior to joining One Network, Todd spent nine years at ExoStar LLC holding leadership positions in product management, product marketing, and product operations. He was most recently Director of Solutions, where he was responsible for product strategy of ExoStar's supply chain collaboration product offerings. Previously, Todd was with General Electric Information Services, now GXS, and Expedia Consulting. As with all of our events, one of our goals is to make them as interactive as possible and get as much feedback as you throughout. So please notice the bottom right-hand corner of your screen where there's a Q&A feature. Please ask questions of the speakers throughout. Please ask questions using the Q&A feature and not the chat panel. Our panelists will not be able to see questions that are submitted through the chat function. So with that, I'd like to again thank you all for attending, and would like to hand the floor over to Dave to get started. Thanks, Kara. I appreciate it. Uh, today, I'm going to take a couple minutes to go through uh, the Del Monte inbound supply solution and how we leveraged um, th that solution to um, add to our demand-driven supply chain. And um, I want to take a couple slides. First of all, I'm going to go over uh, just some of the program background to give you some insights to uh, where we are coming from and why we went to this next step uh, in uh, our evolution of uh, supply chain efficiency. We'll talk specifically about the supplier collaboration project, um, some of the things that um, we had to do to really uh, get our uh, suppliers to align uh, and uh, partner with us, um, the benefits that we're looking for, as well as uh, some of the takeaways. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Todd uh, to go over uh, the specific one network solutions that we've partnered with to help us enable this, uh, these benefits. So, if I go to the next slide, this is mainly an introduction to Del Monte Foods in general. We're a little less than $4 billion in sales um, uh, each year, uh, and most folks recognize us for uh, a lot of the consumer product goods on the right-hand side of, this, of the slide, which is about $2 billion in our sales. Uh, in there, you'll see the Del Monte Shield uh, recognized label, which is our vegetables and food products, uh, our uh, uh, collagen products, and so forth. Uh, what a lot of folks don't know, though, is that uh, almost $2 billion of our sales come from pet food products. And these are brands that, that many folks enjoy uh, and, and uh, eat to their animals uh, every day, and that's kibble and bits and milk bone and pepperoni and meow mix. Uh, so we have a very extensive pet products uh, uh, division as well. Um, to talk a little bit about Del Monte uh, and supporting those product lines, uh, we essentially have um, about 5,500 ship to locations and about 3,500 SKUs uh, that we uh, work with our customers on. And uh, we manage those strategically through about 10 DCs. 
And to support those distribution centers, we have about 41 manufacturing and co-manufacturing locations. And it says in the fried U.S., but it's really worldwide um, to support uh, the distribution network. Uh, and then to help us uh, with our manufacturing processes, we have um, um, 1,300 growers, um, suppliers, um, you know, farms in many cases. Uh, and those can be packaging suppliers. They can be uh, metal can suppliers. Uh, in uh, with our pet food products, you see a lot of proteins, a lot of grains, and a lot of commodities, which are a lot of fun to manage. Uh, a lot of fun to manage in these markets today. If I move to the next slide, um, you see that we have actually really uh, put a lot of money in, into our supply chain, and in both fixed assets, uh, in manufacturing capabilities, investments as well as solutions. Um, we've uh, expanded our dry uh, pet manufacturing capabilities and created a matrix of manufacturing capabilities across our supply chain to really pull miles out of the system uh, and really uh, create a lot of efficiencies within our distribution facilities and distribution network as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've made several strategic investments, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, uh, that uh, helps us with transportation optimization, deployment execution, and really kind of coming to what we're talking about today, which is our inbound supply solutions. And the reason we've put so much money in, into these solutions um, is that our uh, head of operations believes very strongly that uh, superior supply chain execution, uh, customer flow rates uh, on, on, uh, on shelf stock uh, are all very important um, to, to the customer and a very important component to the sales model. So we think uh, uh, customer service levels uh, are essential and superior customer support is an essential component uh, to uh, servicing our clients. And you can see that through our investments. Moving to uh, demand driven, uh, really this, this started about five or six years ago um, through um, a main objective uh, and that was um, to really drive superior supply chain and service uh, performance uh, while decreasing cost. And that's often hard to do. You can you can certainly improve performance by investing in inventory, but that obviously raises a lot of cost, a lot of capital implications of that. Um, or you can take out costs with service usually roads. But to do both is, is very, very uh, difficult. Uh, but it was a key tenant for our demand-driven program. And uh, we had a common theme across each one of these different programs. Uh, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, really. Um, but what we had to do is look at it from a supply chain perspective and really kind of, um, you know, go beyond the simple into some fairly complex problems. For example, there's an example on the slide there. Uh, instead of sending a, a truckload of people every week to our warehouses, we actually send a blended mix of product lines uh, via more optimal uh, transportation modes. Uh, and that does require a lot of sophistication and collaboration within the supply chain. So we move to uh, the themes, which I talked about. It's really three key ones, uh, the first one being um, push versus pull. Uh, and uh, we have demand signals coming from consumption uh, at the store level uh, every, every day. And what uh, our vision was is to tie uh, those consumption signals to reactions within the supply chain. Uh, and when the first uh, couple projects started, it was really tying those uh, consumption signals to our distribution center. And what we've done is over time gone deeper and deeper and deeper into the supply chain uh, to be able to react to those signals. Uh, and we are trying uh, in, in, in to really touch that real-time signal. So we're looking at daily data daily. Uh, versus some kind of um, forecasted uh, hope. Uh, and uh, we're reacting to promotions and consumptions and surprises uh, all the time, uh, and we're able to uh, deliver the secure um, service levels because of the uh, recency of the data. And lastly, the multi-party supply chain solution. You, you can't just optimize one component of it. You really need to look deep into the supply chain multiple years back. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're really just going to cause an issue. And that's really why we went down the road of the inbound supply solution, because we had optimized the front part of the supply chain. We were really suffering, and I'll kind of explain why we were suffering 
and then it's we're really suffering at the manufacturing location back into the supply base. Uh, but if you take those two concepts down, really they boil down to, hey, if we sell one, we need to replenish one in the distribution network. We need to make one in their co-pack uh, partners and our uh, manufacturing centers, and then we need to buy the raw materials to replace those. Uh, and we need to synchronize though, those to make sure that we don't have excess inventory sitting around that causes us capital cost. And certainly, if we have changes in product lines, we're not, we don't have an excessive amount of waste sitting there uh, because uh, we have to throw away packaging. If I move to the next slide, um, the demand-driven project didn't just happen at once, uh, and we really took uh, it in different uh, stages of the supply chain. Uh, it really start, started out with the retail order forecast, uh, and then how that collaborated with deployment was the first main move. From there, um, we moved into tra transportation optimization and inventory planning, uh, and then we moved into the DCs and took DC capacity management, as well as uh, carrier scheduling into the distribution centers. So uh, the blue circles you see there on the right are really the first few years of a demand-driven evolution. Uh, and we got very optimal uh, in that uh, part of the supply chain. However, uh, that optimization had stopped <laughs> when we got past the distribution center into the plants, uh, and uh, we were uh, having to uh, react quickly to changes um, in the manufacturing requirements. Uh, the suppliers had a hard time kind of keeping up on their raw materials, uh, and uh, we, we would uh, compensate that with uh, a lift in our inventory levels. Um, so that's why we uh, partnered with One Network to move into our inbound supply component of the, the demand-driven solution. And that consists of about five main categories. You have contract management and uh, the approved vendor list management. Purchase order management allows us to actually create the contractual obligations or in, interact with the suppliers as well as the release mechanisms against the purchase orders. A supplier portal, so we can collaborate with the suppliers on shipments and invoicing, on making sure that uh, when we believe that there's going to be a response to an order, a, a shipment coming in, um, that we uh, are alerted if there's not. Uh, this also allows us to be very successful in consignment, and that is, um, I, I don't think uh, it's, it's very common overall in CBT as a practice. Um, it, it certainly is involving. But it's going to become more and more common, and more and more of our suppliers in uh, packaging and ingredients have embraced consigned materials and vendor managed inventory. And really, uh, our legacy systems could not enable those business practices efficiently. Uh, and that's uh, one of the key capabilities uh, that one, one, one network helps us uh, enable. And then lastly, it's not just about the raw materials into the plant. It's really that uh, international and domestic co-manufacturing platform in order to make sure that those are also synchronized into the demand-driven supply chain as well. So that's, that's kind of how we got to inbound supply. Um, let's talk a little bit about inbound supply. So you can see we move into the next part of the presentation, which is supplier collaboration. Uh, kind of a, a silly slide, but it, it does not – uh, far uh, hit the mark too far away. I mean, it, it, a lot of these statements, uh, there's some close realities to them. Uh, we had a very efficient uh, supply chain solution in front of the DCs. We had great uh, consumption information. Uh, the plants react to that, but the suppliers lacked that synchronization. Uh, so we would, we would have manual processes, and we would be faxing reactions, there would be a lot of phone call interactions, there would be, um, you know, expedited communications, uh, a lot of double and triple touches, and there'd be situations where, you know, someone would put in an order for a very small amount, and then it's going to know that the order went, you know, well, we need, you know, 10x what we thought we, we, we needed, uh, and then uh, we'd be expediting trucks, and then all of a sudden, um, another change uh, would happen, and then we're actually asking the supplier not to deliver. That didn't happen a ton, but it did happen from time to time. Uh, and we realized that in order to realize the true benefits of demand-driven uh, planning, we needed to extend that functionality deeper into the supply base into co-manufacturers and tier one and tier two suppliers. If 
I move to the after, what we have now is really a multi-party inventory forecasting and replenishment solution for the supply chain. Um, this solution allows us to uh, see inventory across the network, uh, allows us to create contractual purchase orders um, for items, and allows us to collaborate consumption forecasts with the suppliers, uh, and it allows the suppliers to better plan their production schedules and their ordering uh, for our requirements. Um, we get notifications if we're starting starting to burn too fast through um, purchase orders and, and we're consuming more volume than we anticipated, as well as the opposite if um, there's a, a problem where we're not consuming enough, uh, we might end up with uh, excess on the ticker page to file obligation. It also allows us to get updates uh, if uh, we're expecting a shipment and we're not seeing the shipment. If we're expecting it to leave the supplier and it doesn't happen, uh, which is a very powerful uh, component. The, last, uh, the next component is really consignment. And that's a key for us is because we, we've moved a significant portion of our contracts over to a consigned and DMI type of model, uh, and uh, this allows us to get us there. And finally, um, because uh, the previous slide was so centered around manual processes, um, it was really hard to either award or um, uh, find fault with the supply chain um, because there wasn't an automated mechanism to track execution and execution performance. Uh, so now that we have the solution, the supplier performance analytics um, are more fair uh, and they're more actionable by the supplier itself. If there's no basis of fact for analytics, then what happens is, is the buyers tend not to leverage them and the suppliers ignore them. And now we have uh, a good basis of fact. So that's the solution. I give you a little insight to what demand driven means to Delmoni and how we got there and then as well as what we did to get into the supply chain. Talk a little bit about benefits as I move to that slide. Um, really the anticipated ben benefits center from a dollar perspective around inventory. Um, and the reason was is uh, as we talked about before, the customer is the most important thing. So um, stock outs, the inability to manufacture, and cut orders are unacceptable. And so if you don't have the functionality and if you're using brute force methods, what happens inevitably is you use inventory as the crutch to fix poor customer service. And that's what we did. Uh, our raw material inventories um, were, were higher than I think was optimal. Uh, and uh, that's really where we're getting a lot of savings is enforcement of methodologies to make sure that the inventory levels are optimal uh, based upon uh, consumption profile, enablement of uh, consigned inventory that allows another uh, supplier to actually own the goods until it's actually consumed, uh, as well as making sure that the raw material inventory for co manufactured finished, I'm sorry, uh, the finished good inventory for co manufactured goods also are optimal. Uh, there are uh, some additional benefits. Um, from time to time, it was really rare because we did have the inventory. We would have to expedite some items, um, and uh, we certainly think this is going to provide some benefits to that as well. There's also uh, a, a lot of um, transactional benefits to the solution as well. We uh, are able to create electronic order. It's visible to the supply chain. The supplier ships. Um, the invoicing um, processes happen via the system. There is a three-way match methodology that goes into a payment process. Um, that means that we have a lot of transactions to the new solution that are hands-free, non-touched uh, purchases. Um, very, um, it's not just the labor component that's a benefit for us, but it's really the error handling. Um, we probably spend more money in, in the company uh, handling problems uh, that happen uh, than the actual uh, transactional invoice uh, component, and this fixes both. And 
the last piece is that some of the results should not only um, financial but non-financial, and that's really what the customers believe uh, we're doing as a supplier. Um, and you can see from the, the awards and accolades we've received from our, our customer base, they are pleased uh, with demand-driven. And it, this doesn't just start to stop with supply chain. It's really the entire system, as well as really the uh, methodologies and processes within the company that sets the customer uh, as, as the number one uh, component for the supply chain. All right. So if we move to back to content, you see that uh, we're to takeaways. And what I thought I'd do here is just share um, – some insights that might help. Um, you know, I, I listen to some webinars from time to time, and one of the things that uh, I always um, get a sense of is that things go easily and smoothly all the time. <laughs> and that 99% uh, of the time is not the case. Uh, and, and these systems, um, you know, sometimes uh, uh, don't work out exactly like you think they're going to be. And uh, for our case, it was about supplier adoption. Um, you know, uh, our suppliers um, had this stance with us at, at the beginning of the, uh, the implementation of it, uh, looking at each other and seeing who was going to be the first one to move. Um, there were a couple key suppliers that we were kind of focused on. Uh, and I think some of them just had this uh, thought process that, um, you know, if I wait, maybe this, uh, maybe this requirement will go away because <laughs> I have a lot of different customers. Uh, and uh, this could be some complexity, uh, complexity for us. Um, so we had to really work closely with the supply base uh, to uh, to get the adoption. I think we we, we actually turned that around to a, a fantastic success story. We had uh, amazing adoption in the supply base, and the reason is is we gave them a, um, we gave them reasons to say yes. We we helped them get there. Uh, both financially as well as, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, a lot of transactional benefits. Uh, we took the stance that we're not going to charge the suppliers. We're not going to ask them to treat any burden, financial burden, to implement this solution. So Del Monte actually made the investment for the suppliers. Uh, and then the next part of the story was to get everybody together and say, hey, this is what you're going to receive through this partnership. This is the visibility you're going to get. This is the type of consumption you're going to see, and this is what it means for you in terms of um, being able to optimize your production schedules. This is what it means for you in terms of inventory reduction, uh, and these are benefits that you will realize. So for the suppliers, um, it, it was a great value prop for them. It, uh, it allowed them to, um, you know, obviously if we're being very flexible for the customer, they were probably having a lot of inventory themselves uh, in order to support our uh, changing environment. So this allowed them to uh, get benefits from it at no cost. Um, and then we, uh, we really partnered at, at a senior level to get uh, a couple of the key folks. And once the key suppliers moved forward and everybody saw that this was actually a benefit and we're on display, uh, then it was a massive boost. Um, that was the external stakeholders. We also had to get the internal folks aligned as well. And uh, that was a challenge for a couple of the internal uh, players. No, change is not something everybody just automatically moves towards. And there were certainly some some folks within our you know, uh, plants, uh, even uh, the purchasing organization itself, as well as accounts payable, that all needed to embrace the change. And uh, making them a part of the change and uh, getting them aligned early uh, was some of the learnings we got out of that. Uh, and um, I, I probably, if I look back in, in retrospect, we probably didn't do enough to get them involved early. Uh, they are uh, all actively engaged and very happy on this uh, uh, solution. Uh, but, uh, you know, letting them know as well that this is, uh, you know, the direction we're all moving uh, and to work with us on specific concerns and or uh, processes that they do within the, the functional domain uh, that we need to incorporate um, uh, certainly make a big benefit. Uh, and then data quality was the last piece. Um, that just, you know, looking back, we had some assumptions in data quality, both in terms of the vendor master, the item master, the materials, uh, and um, 
some of them were, those assumptions were quite flawed. Uh, and we had to do some additional work that, um, that uh, certainly uh, uh, nobody anticipated. But those were our three, um, you know, key uh, focal points that on what, you know, we could do to make, you know, make it uh, a quicker time to, uh, to implementation and a quicker time to benefit. If I move now, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it back over to Kara and uh, let her uh, either turn over to Todd or maybe we'll take a question. Yeah, why don't we do that? I just have a quick follow-up question, then we'll go over to Todd to do the one network piece. First of all, I want to congratulate you guys. I know that the demand-driven journey is often a, a long one and very difficult, and you were very honest about what worked and what didn't work, so I appreciate that. Um, I'm curious about the supplier community. You talked about the importance of supplier adoption, and culture is always important, the culture and, and change and resistance to change in this kind of project. So I'm, I'm curious, even though you gave them a reason to say yes, have you had any resistance from your suppliers? And if so, how did you convince them to participate? Uh, yeah, that, that certainly was the, the key constituent to uh, sell on the program, uh, and uh, there was there was absolutely re resistance uh, at the beginning, uh, we, and it wasn't because of the solution itself. The solution itself um, is it, very presentable; it's, everybody can see that it's going to benefit. I think it stems from we had been pushing an EDI solution for a number of years, uh, and uh, they. There was a slow adoption process, and uh, the supply base was kind of resistant to it. And now here we are moving into a different direction, and, and, and I think that's one of the reasons that they were frustrated. Uh, in, in terms of getting them there, um, again, it, it, it kind of falls into the value prop, providing them a reason to say yes, um, and then the improvements and efficiencies for them. And then the uh, the other one is just to uh, – to find the big players that are, are going to help you with the overall supply chain. For example, in ingredients, there are some big names, and uh, and you know, if you if you, uh, if you can move ADM and Cargill and uh, Hormel and other big big players and get them partnered up, then the smaller folks tend to react quickly uh, in order to keep the business. If you can get Silgen on the metal. These are fairly big names in the packaging world as well. And once you get those big players on um, through interactions, then the uh, smaller folks tend to come over. Okay, that makes sense. Perfect. Well, thank you. I'm going to bring you back um, after Todd's section for the Q&A at the end. So, Todd, I want to turn the floor over to you for a little bit more information on One Network and the, the solution itself. Great. Thanks, Kara. And Dave, let me just say I appreciate you taking the time today to walk us through the Del Monte demand-driven journey. We've been working with Del Monte on this initiative since its inception for about five or six now, five or six years now. I'm very proud to be a part of your success. And for the audience, thanks for your time. We hope uh, you leave today's session with a clear understanding of the One Network solution. And I very much encourage you to submit questions in the QA box in the right-hand corner. So for those of you not familiar with One Network, we've been around since 2002, we started out in the transportation logistics software space and spent the last six or seven years expanding our solution footprint to include a variety of services required to enable demand-driven value networks. And I know that's still generally a new industry term, but what we mean by demand-driven value networks is that we provide solutions that leverage forward most demand, such as a statistical forecast, sales forecast, or actual point of sale data to intelligently predict planning and execution requirements for all participants in the supply chain. And I'll provide more detail on how we do that in the next couple of slides. But at its core, we provide a network-based solution that's delivered via the cloud. And what we do is we fill the white space between trading partners, so understanding that CPG companies, manufacturers, retail, co-manufacturers, and suppliers all work within their own enterprise system. So what we do is help integrate and synchronize the information in real time across those systems. And in the end, the real goal of One Network and the reason we're here is to help companies improve service levels, free up working capital by reducing inventory-related costs, transportation, and operational costs. 
Next slide. So just to give you an idea of our customer list, we serve a variety of different industries. We've got roughly 4,000, 4 to 5,000 customers on one network today, spanning a variety of different industry segments, including defense, the public sector, obviously CPG, high tech, retail, grocers, and a variety of different logistics providers. And just to set the stage for what we mean by demand-driven value network, here's a sample multi-echelon value chain that consists of a retail store, a retail distribution center, four distribution center manufacturing plants, care manufacturers, and raw material suppliers. And historically, each of these enterprises may be working in their own internal system, working off of their own calculated statistical forecast. And what happens when each of these enterprises is working on a different forecast, the data is not integrated, synchronized with real-time execution data, which leads to inconsistent, outdated information across the network. And typically what happens to maintain service levels, as Dave mentioned, companies are increasing inventory buffers to cushion for demand and supply volatility. And across the execution or the movement of material across this value network, the transportation cost may not be optimal because companies aren't taking into consideration truck capacity, warehouse storage capacity, or dock scheduling. And so what we do is we provide a variety of services across the different tiers of this value network, leveraging forward most demand. In this case, since we're talking about a retail store, we can leverage the point of sale data at that store level translate that data into demand planning requirements, not only for the retail DC, but for every participant in this value chain. So we're actually taking that point of sale data and other statistical forecast information and generating multi-echelon forecasts and purchase orders across all tiers of the supply chain. And then we're taking those planning requirements and comparing them against supply plans as well as capacity plans. So when we talk about capacity, we're referring to storage capacity, transportation capacity, or even capacity at the dock level to receive the material. And so to help optimize the planning and execution, um, we, we leverage a multi-party, many-to-many single version of the truth. So all participants are integrated on the same common platform. In the next couple of slides, I'll talk a little bit more about the details and, and what that means. And what we're doing is we're continuously monitoring demand changes from the forwardmost demand and then marrying that against execution to incrementally plan or replan planning and execution across an entire value stream. In addition, we'll identify, proactively identify potential disconnects or mismatches in the supply chain. And not only do we generate alerts to notify the appropriate user, but we can actually replan that supply chain based on that projected disconnect for either the entire value chain or the specific subnet within that supply chain. And then I mentioned that this sample, all these enterprises are working within their own enterprise systems. So we developed our platform so that we can integrate with a variety of different systems to help fill that, that white space. And then, you know, benefits of enabling this demand-driven value network, Dave touched on all these, but the benefits help uh, lower inventory costs, transport, transportation costs, reduce expediting fees, improve operational efficiency, and ultimately help improve working capital and customer service levels. Next slide here. So uh, what I wanted to do with this slide was provide a illustrative view of the One Network solution and how we actually do enable demand-driven value networks. So in the middle here, you see the One Network platform. We refer to it as our many-to-many, multi-echelon platform. And that's used to integrate each of the participants in their internal systems into a common platform. So we take master data, vendor master, item master, normalize, clean that data, 
and then we provide a variety of services on top of that platform. And so the first one there, Intelligent Demand, that's our solution that enables customer demand sen sensing and intelligent replenishment planning. More focus on the end customer in this particular scenario could be the retail store. And so manufacturers taking that demand signal from the store level and sensing what the projected forecast and order requirements are down the supply chain. And then we have our intelligent supply solution. And this is a solution that manages the inbound supply and planning and execution. And then across both of the intelligent demand and intelligent solution is our intelligent logistics solution. And that is used to optimize scheduling and transportation costs across the entire value network. And then the fourth solution below here, uh, we refer to it as our DevNet or development services. That allows development organizations to actually leverage our technology to build and deploy new services in the cloud. They can augment existing One Network services or build new services that sit within the One Network cloud or their own internal private cloud. And as I mentioned, the, the platform leverages master data, so it's got a transactional backbone, provide a variety of solutions, demand supply, logistics, and development network. And then we provide a variety of value-add services across those solutions. So we provide predictive and historic analytics across each of our solution areas. We provide sustainability services in the area of food safety and carbon footprint tracking. Obviously, if we have each tier of the supply chain from the, the field to the grower all the way to the store level, we can track uh, food safety and traceability back down the supply chain, as well as the carbon emissions footprint across that supply chain. And then across everything we're doing that often gets overlooked is we're taking capacity constraints at the warehouse level, at the shelf level, at the dock level, as well as the transportation capacity in order to help define what the execution requirements are against the, the planning forecast. Next slide. So we talked about specifically our intelligent supply solution, and, and Dave mentioned that that's what they're using for their inbound supply solution. And so here at the bottom, you see Del Monte has their legacy ERP system integrated into the One Network platform. They have a variety of co-manufacturers, co-manufacturers integrated in the platform, as well as their raw material suppliers and their 3PL providers. And then on top of the platform, they're leveraging a variety of different services, including replenishment planning, forecast collaboration, where they're actually generating forecasts and providing those to their co-manufacturers and raw material suppliers for replenishment planning. We have engines built into our tool to auto-generate what we refer to as predictive orders based on demand plans. Once those predictive orders are created, we can actually identify the appropriate supplier based on Del Monte's contract rules and sourcing policies. And then we enable the entire procure-to-pay cycle from that order creation all the way through shipment receipt, invoice creation, and even auto-invoice creation based on procurement and replenishment policies. For example, if it's a value-rated receipt settlement process where Del Monte pays their supplier when the materials get received at the Del Monte plant, we can automate those, those invoices on behalf of the supplier once the materials get received. And then in addition to standard discrete purchase order types of processes and blanket orders, as Dave mentioned, we provide BMI capability and consignment. So BMI suppliers and consignment suppliers are both using the same tool that Del Monte uses in order to drive the replenishment process and procurement through invoice for those programs. And in regards to um, the supplier, the size of the supplier, technical sophistication, we provide suppliers with multiple options to onboard and participate in Del Monte's program. So uh, one of the questions today was, how do you convince your suppliers to participate? And we like to, to think of it as um, we'll provide you, you 
the supplier with these options that you need to automate your business process and drive value to your business process. So some of Dell Mining suppliers use the web portal to actually log into a web interface to receive orders, check inventory levels and hot items, as well as leveraging the tool to create orders for VMI programs. We also support EDI for some of the higher transactional volume suppliers. And we can support web services, XML integration as well. And then the last component here that Dell Mining is leveraging across our intelligent supply solution is the supplier scorecarding. So we're actually tracking supplier performance against delivery requirements, contract terms, contract terms, et cetera, in order to provide Delmani with a with dashboards to track the supplier performance and drive continuous improvements across their inbound supply. And with that, um, again, I just wanted to thank folks for their time today, and I hope that provides you with a high-level overview of the One Network solution. And to summarize, what we do is we leverage the foremost demand to predict planning requirements. We intelligently compute execution activity and optimize logistics. Now I'll turn it back over to Kara to see if we have any questions. Great, Todd. Thanks. That was really helpful. Um, there is one question that I want to make sure that we get to um, uh, that came in from the audience. That the, the question about how one network is really different from other supplier portal or EDI tools. So um, why make sure we really make that clear? Sure. We, that's funny because we get that question a lot. It's a good question. So supplier portals and EDI tools um, are, are a way of exchanging transactions from an ERP system over the Internet with trading partners. And while they obviously provide value over antiquated processes of sending orders and managing inbound supply via phone or fax machine, um, they're, very, they're, they're really limited in the level of value they can provide and really fall short when supply chain organizations try to take their supply chain to that next level or to a demand-driven model. And portals integrate with MRP procurement planning tools, and they provide visibility of requirements and orders to the first-tier supplier. But as, as Dave mentioned, they, they don't typically provide that level of visibility and synchronization of planning and execution information across multiple echelons of the supply chain. And the impact of that is the higher probability that your supply network is out of sync with the latest demand information because the execution information does not reflect reality. And with one network, we do provide a portal component, we provide an EDI component as well, but we provide a variety of optimization engines that work with a company's internal systems and their partner systems to auto-generate those replenishment requirements, the multi-echelon forecasts and orders to drive that execution and fulfillment uh, across the value chain. And we feel like the complete, fully integrated planning, execution, collaboration, and business intelligence capability provides that additional level of value that helps companies achieve their demand-driven supply chain initiatives. Which aren't easy, as we know, so I appreciate that. Thank you, Todd. That definitely helps. Okay, let's bring Dave back in um, to the conversation because there's certainly a lot of questions that are coming in. We have time for just a few. So, Dave, I want to go back to you to really um, talk about how to get started. There's some questions coming in about, you know, your recommendations for which process to start with and maybe if you can talk a little bit about the business case um, for the investment. Uh, sure. Um to get started, uh, well, what we did is we started off with understanding our uh, current processes. We actually leveraged uh, Lean, uh, and we did a, um, a value stream map on uh, what really was essential uh, in the uh, direct material procure to pay process. Uh, found out there was some wasted, you know, significant wasted effort to the whole thing, as I mentioned, uh, in a lot of manual touches and, uh, and um, duplicate touches and so forth. Uh, and uh, so those those processes really helped um, uh, work uh, helped us work closer uh, with one network onto what was the core solution we were trying to enable for the for, the, uh, for inbound supply. Um, 
while we did that, uh, we actually looked at the value prop. So in parallel, we were treating what the actual value prop for the solution was. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was an inventory focused value prop, a significant inventory reduction. Um, and then we leveraged that against our weighted average cost of capital that had a financial, uh, you know, benefit to the company. Uh, so, um, you know, essentially that process was, here's the processes, one that worked, uh, certainly said, hey, this is what we can enable. Uh, here's the, um, the implementation, uh, uh, requirements for that. Uh, and then we balanced that against the value prop for that, and then we moved forward with that inside the organization through, um, uh, yeah. actually I drove it to get approval from the uh, senior executive level. So I, I think that worked pretty well, and I, that's probably what I would, I would recommend for someone who is trying to go down this road. Um, Todd, what is the average time for implementation? Is Delmont is a pretty big company. Is what, what they're experiencing typical? Yeah, I mean, so, so keep in mind with our cloud-based network model, there actually is no infrastructure or software to be implemented. You know, the time is really in assessing the differences in functional requirements versus what's available in a tool today, setting up those specific business processes, integrating with your existing systems and then user onboarding. So um, you know, the canned answer to that, to that question is it depends, but it very much depends on the service or services that you require um, and the complexity of the integration to your enterprise system. And that being said, we do have uh, some services such as our order management service that can be up and running for a company in a matter of weeks. And so, you know, compared to some of the larger ERP types of deployments that take uh, months or even years, it's a much faster time to value in, in deployment cycle. Okay. Um, let me end with that, that software as a service piece. So, Dave, how did you guys come to the conclusion to use a software as a service provider instead of going down that ERP route? <laughs> well, uh, at Del Monte, we think the ERP route is a pretty scary route. In fact, <laughs> You know, it's kind of comparable to that, you know, going through the forest and the Wizard of Oz. Um, no, you know, what we did is we looked at it practically. Um, you know, certainly there was an entire internal audit assessment that happened. Uh, you know, if you're talking about purchase orders um, being on a, a SaaS model, uh, we had internal audit go all over that uh, just to understand the risk implications of that and uh, the, the practices within one network. Um, more, more than make sure that, um, you know, our, our risks were, you know, uh, the same as a, um, you know, behind the, the firewall ERP system. Um, a lot of uh, redundancy, a lot of uh, labor practices, uh, and so forth. Um, from there, you, you look at it from, just from a cost perspective, um, it, it makes a lot of sense to go this way. Uh, and essentially, the architecture really is designed for, you know, what we need with inbound supply. This is a network requirement. This is a collaborative requirement with many, many different folks outside the four walls. And that's where SAS really makes a lot of sense is that it, it allows that uh, allows you to work with, uh, collaborate, interact with companies uh, over the network um, because the model is optimized for that. Okay, perfect. Todd, I'll let you uh, get the final word and anything else to add on that about the, the sensitive information and, and the fact that it is open? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's another good question. Um, all of our customers perform some level of audit against the tool, and um, we've never failed one yet. And we've got several government deployments within the public sector as well as defense, so you can imagine the, the security audits that, that they go through on the technology. And, so we've got a risk permissibility framework and security model to ensure that the, the data is protected and that the appropriate user is accessing the data that they have that they should be accessing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today, but I do want to thank David McLean from Del Monte Foods and Todd Walker from One Network Enterprises. I hope you guys have gotten a lot of good information about how to move your demand-driven journey along. The, the recording of this webinar will be available within 24 hours online at consumerfish.com. So I want to thank you all very much for your time today. Have a great afternoon.